Hi. Um, I've certainly touched on this. Uh, maybe that mm, should be my intro. <laughs> I try to make each intro to the video a bit different from the last, so I try to use different opening words. Um, I don't know. I just it's when I'm thinking, I make that silly sound. Um, yeah. So when um, lost my trail of thought now. Yeah. Um, this video is a bit random, uh, just because, you know, I had no videos to upload, so this seems as good as any. Uh, I have spoken about this before, but um, it's something that I do feel very strongly about. For me personally, the biggest sacrifice with coronavirus lockdowns has actually been probably the cinema. Now, there's other things I enjoy. I enjoy going to coffee shops relaxing with a newspaper or a magazine um that's something i miss a lot as well and i have a lot of sympathy with small business owners uh well any businesses really um but particularly small business owners who no doubt will be struggling with this constant yo-yo of lockdown then back to business lockdown and back to business um i understand they're being given given some support from the government but Certainly, it must be causing them a great deal of stress. So uh, I have huge sympathy for the situation they're in. Um, and I would also say, you know, whilst I understand and support the lockdown measures, um, nobody, nobody should be trivialising uh, anything to do with this. Uh, I have seen some people online say things like, oh, um, you know, it's just a little bit of, uh, you just need to stay in for a while and it's not a hardship. Well, actually, that's that's just very flippant and I think wrong because the mental health impact that people could be going through regarding um, financial anxieties if they run a business or even if they um, are on furlough because you know they they were in a company then that that, that, that excuse me that then had to close down um, the the social disruption that this thing has caused unparalleled unparalleled in modern times nothing comes close to it you know after september 11th there was significant aviation disruption so the whole way that we flew and traveled changed uh, and the markets were immediately impacted by that and of course there was the geopolitics uh the controversial war on terror and so on but it didn't even that didn't have anywhere near the sort of global reach in terms of disruption to everyday life um, you really have to go back to World War Two um, and other major pandemics like the Black Death. One thing about the Black Death, of course, was although it was the deadliest event in human history of any kind, you know, you take all the wars, all the pandemics, the Black Death of the High Middle Ages is thought to be the deadliest event in human history. Um, paradoxically, though, what came out of that, the European Renaissance came out of that. Um, a different structure in the relationship between peasants and landlords came out of that. Peasants had more bargaining power, so there were great social changes. It is possible. Um, there was a cabinet member, I think it was Rishi Sunak, but it may have been someone else who mentioned that this may be an opportunity for a sort of 1945 moment. That is to say, the actually, I think it was Jeremy Hunt the former health secretary and foreign secretary said that this may be an opportunity. And this wasn't in a sort of cynical, callous way. I, I think he was on something. I think he was probably right. Um, that this may be a, a time to really look at, for example, how we handle social care and really have some sort of drastic overhaul, improving lives. I mean, the NHS came out of the war years um, with that labor majority government. So if life just went back to normal, um, it would be, you know, unfortunate. Certainly some things have to get back to normal. We cannot continue life for years to come just in constant lockdown. The financial strain that would cause, the social strain, you know, loneliness, all those sort of things. Um, and masks, I think people are fed up with them. I am. I don't find them comfortable. I don't like wearing them. And I don't even have allergies, so um, I think there'll be a giant bonfire of face masks at the end of this year. 
So there needs to be a return to normality in the sense of day to day life. But I think there has to be a change in terms of uh, certainly our response to pandemics. I do think the government could have done some things differently. Um, so definitely things need to be learned from this. It almost sounds flippant to say lessons need to be learned because we're talking about 120,000 deaths. It's staggering. It is really a high figure. Um, so, you know, this can't just be like a train crash where there's a report that is done, maybe compensation is given to the victims and then some things change within the industry. This is sweeping. This affects everything. It really does. Um, but I think definitely social care is one area that needs to be looked at. Um, response to pandemics. Um, society. You know, a lot of good things have come out of this. It's easy to be cynical, but neighbours have been looking out for one another. There has been a lot of good in humanity. That's one of the good things about this. Not that there's many good things about it, but people have cared more for each other, I think. Um, I mean, today, one of my neighbours, my dad's had health problems recently, and I don't want to talk too much about it in this video, but because that's not what the video is about. But, you know, I, I've only spoken to her a few times, so she knocked my door today, and I thought it was a postman. So it was a very pleasant surprise. She was just checking how I was. She knows I live by myself, and um, I was just very grateful to her for that. Um, so I think some of the best of human nature have come out of this, and that's, that's something to celebrate and to hold on to. Um, there may also be actually positive things, environmentally speaking, simply because there's far less flights and far less um, maritime journeys being done. So it might be that at least temporarily it'll be good for ecology. Conservation, probably been good for conservation. Um, the number of animals hunted has decreased, I understand, that are critically endangered. So there may be some good things coming out of this, but, you know, are we going to learn as, as human civilization? That's the question. Um, so anyway, a oh goodness, seven minutes. Uh, I'll cut to the chase. Cinema. Cinema. This is something that, uh, like I said, I, I miss most of all. My local cinema in Sunderland, we have one big multiplex. It's been closed now since, I think, September. Or maybe it was October, actually, because I remember saying uh, Halloween. It was like the original Halloween was screened for Halloween. Uh, that was October 2020, um, so that's now about four months, or coming up to four months since um, since the cinema was open. Um, now, on their website, they have these reassuring messages, we're working behind the scenes to open as soon as possible. I hope that they are sensible about it. I hope they don't suddenly jolt up the prices, because that will just put people off. And what they really need to do as a business is attract people back. I would even suggest um, if they have a slight reduction in the ticket price to attract people back in order to boost the business. As it stands, it's £5.99 for all tickets, which is it's reasonable. That's not too excessive. I remember I went to watch a documentary last year. Um, it was at David Attenborough, a wildlife documentary. I think it was kind of an accumulation of his work at, at 90. Um, it was... They were asking for 17 quid for that because it was live streamed. Uh, I just walked out. That was just extortionate. So I think sometimes, you know, big companies kind of score an own goal with that sort of situation where they just ask for unreasonable um, prices. Uh, so I, I don't know how many people went to see that, but certainly I was the only one there and I wasn't going to pay that. So. I just hope that they're sensible and they don't suddenly notch up the prices. I'm not saying they will, but they might. Who knows? Um, no, that's a big multiplex cinema. Certainly small independent cinemas must be really struggling. And I understand some cinema chains, entire chains, are suspended indefinitely. Uh, this local cinema I mentioned is an empire. Uh, but View Cinemas and UGCs, I think they are definitely facing big question mark and the industry in general around the world because cinemas, uh, movie theaters for Amer my American viewers, the, the future is deeply uncertain. 
Now, this has probably been a very good time for Netflix. And the other one, I think, is Sky Cinema Original. But, you know, they're, they're throwing in the word cinema there. Now, to me, cinema is only the big screen. But that's my thinking about cinema. Call it sentimental. Uh, call it, you know, pedantic. That is my thinking of cinema. Big screen. Okay, it might be a big screen at home. I, I know people could get these projectors, but there's something about that big screen. You know, the lights go off, um, and you might have popcorn, you might not, but regardless, provided some annoying person doesn't have the phone on or isn't talking in front of you, then it's, it's a wonderful experience. I love it. I love the cinema. And the idea that this might be permanently on decline is tragic. I mean, in Sunderland, in the 1960s, we had something like a dozen cinemas, and that was probably true across the country, because at the time, far fewer people had televisions. You know, they were, by the late 60s, starting to become more popular. But my mother, for example, didn't have a TV until she was a teenager. Um, and I imagine that was true for a lot of people. Or if they did have TVs, they were black and white. Um, therefore, cinemas were still widely used at that time. Um, before the pandemic, there was no sign that cinema was in major decline. So it might well be that it does survive this. I really, really hope it does. Because to me, that would be an utter, utter tragedy if the big screen disappears. Um, that's why maybe I have a kind of instinctive knee-jerk hostility to Netflix. Because I feel that it's kind of putting up competition. Um, no doubt it's doing very well. I've seen a bit of Netflix when I was at my brother's house. He let me watch some of the things that they had saved. Um, I think there's a lot of good content there. So my issue is not so much with the content. I think, for example, I've seen clips of the crime. And I, look, I can see why it gets acclaim. It's very engaging. Uh, you know, it's like, a, it's like a history documentary through the Queen's reign. So I can see why things like that are very appealing. And why they would be lucrative. Um... Sky Movie Originals, I imagine it's similar to Netflix. I've no doubt these companies are, you know, really, really raking in from the virus with so many people are at home. And I'm not blaming them for that. They're, they're just doing what, you know, that's just a stupid business. But aside from the fact that it poses competition to the big screen, and there's been a lot of debate around this, I, I my sneaking suspicion is it does, but... Leaving that aside, I've got some practical issues with Netflix. My understanding is you pay a certain amount and then you have this range of films that you then have a period of time in which you can watch them. Uh, I'm a bit old school. Um, I like, you know, I'm not a Puritan. But I, I find I've bought the latest thing and then it's changing due to the latest technology the following year. So it was. it's always been like this. When I had VHS videos, I was kind of hostile to the idea of DVDs. Now I've got literally about 1,000 DVDs, and now it's Blu-rays are sort of coming in. So maybe I'm a bit stubborn, maybe I need to be a bit more flexible, but um, I, I, I can never see a situation where a small screen will have the same feeling as the big screen. The small screen's great, don't get me wrong. If you know, you want to relax in your own home at night time. Um, often I multitask when I watch a film. Uh, you know, you can get a coffee, you can get a drink in a way that you can't necessarily do in the cinema. So it has certain merits. Maybe if you're with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, uh, you know, there's certain things that might be different from the cinema. Um, and also you've no idiot talking away in front of you. So I suppose there's that side, but... With Netflix, I mean, this time limitation, even if it's six months or something, if I buy a film and I really like it, that's mine for life. I look after it, I hold on to it. I've had DVDs literally for 15 years. Um, because why, why, would I, why would I get rid of them? If it's a film I like, I'll watch it again. Not immediately, but I will watch it again. So, yeah, I, I'm not a hoarder, but, you know, if I, if I like a film... I'm not going to just watch it once. And that's the thing with Netflix. You sort of watch it and then there's a time limit. And I don't know. Also, it's a bit like a, 
a smartphone contract or a mobile phone contract, they have to pay this upfront cost rather than just, you know, if I go to the cinema, I pay for my ticket, I watch the film, I might like it, I might not, that's it. It's not complicated. With Netflix, it's this whole, like, upfront cost and then, well, I, I don't know, I just, I don't like the contractual side of it. It just feels like yet more unnecessary. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm too cynical. Maybe I'm too cynical. Maybe I can be converted to Netflix. Uh, I don't have it on my TV. I'm not quite sure. I think you need to, like I say, pay an upfront cost. But um, now some might say they've got no sympathy for Hollywood because, you know, the, the, the culture wars have absolutely got into Hollywood. And maybe this is for another video, but I'll briefly mention it. There's no doubt it's part of this debate. Um, cinema has been increasingly politicised. Now, I would argue the film industry has always been political on some level. There's always been overlap between directors and politics, what sort of message they're trying to portray, that sort of thing. But I would argue in the last 10 years, it's kind of like um, trying to tap into that in a very big way, in a way that is so obvious that it becomes a distraction. So when you have such things as Oscar's so white or this obsession about how diverse the cast is, um, I'm not saying it's not a valid debate, uh, but I think that it is starting to override the entertainment value of film because every single discussion now is about you know, oh, this is stereotyping a certain group of people, or is it diverse enough? It's like sensitivity on overdrive. Because in the end of the day, cinema, the film industry is about entertainment. You might get comedies, you might get thrillers, you might get historic epics, which I enjoy. Um, but in the end of the day, we watch films for some form of entertainment or escapism. Even heavy going films, it gets to think, right? It's that's what the film industry is. Um, so I just find it a bit irritating when actors are kind of consumed and people in the film industry are a bit consumed by this sense of self importance. Um, and when they start really bringing politics into their art, I mean, I've always said actors have a right to an opinion. So I would never say, oh, they can't talk about their views on this or that. But when you get someone like Brie Larson saying that she refuses to speak to white male reporters, you know, it's the perception of that is that you're bringing woke ideology into entertainment and people just get tired of it. And I think that's why the film industry is starting to become off-putting. I don't actually think the content has necessarily declined. Uh, I've just been watching a clip from Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. So, you know, you get a good epic film like that. Um, it's still out there. There is still good cinema, uh, good films to be found. Um, but I do think there, this woke ideology, for want of a better term, or the culture wars, they're casting a shadow over the entertainment factor. Where about every single thing is about how diverse is this? Uh, you know, are we showing a strong, independent woman? Are we showing enough minorities? Um, I'm not. I'm really not saying that those things are not valid. They are, but I think people in the industry need to understand that. You know, a lot of people who go to see film. I won't say everyone. I'm not. There, there will be like film students who read into this stuff, and they'll say oh, well, so many women directors or this character portrayed in a certain way or whatever. But I, I would I would kind of be prepared to bet that most people just want to be entertained. They just want good acting. They want a memorable, they want memorable scenes. They want a good soundtrack. Those are the sort of things I look at in a film. Um, realism. I, I do like realism, you know, films that are about history. I think it's important to be, that's why, you know, maybe I'm going off on the tangent here, but recently there was a black actress who played Anne Boleyn. Now, I have no, I have nothing against her as an actress. She's only doing her job. 
you know, if you you take if you have an opportunity as an actress, you're going to take it or an actor. Uh, likewise, Carrie Mulligan um was criticised for portraying a fifty five year old when she's thirty five. So older women criticised that, and I actually understand the contention there. But you know, in the case of the black actress playing Anne Boleyn. Um, th- this is the way the industry is going because what's that doing? It's saying we are doing this just because we want to be diverse. I mean, there's no other way around it. She might be a, a great actress, but Anne Boleyn was not black. She just wasn't. She was described as having um, a dark complexion. Um, but this referred, you know, in the lingo of the time, that could refer to her quick temper. Anne Boleyn was known to be quite have quite a temper on her. She could rival Henry VIII for that. Um, you know, also she had um stand sort of dark eyebrows and certainly dark hair. So that's probably where the dark complexion comes from. It certainly doesn't mean she was black. Now why is that an issue? People might say if she's a good actress, why should it matter? It matters because it's so flipping obvious. You know, you can look at that and chill She'll go through all the history of it, Henry's split from Rome, etc. But unless you're blind, you'll you just think, yeah, that's a black actress playing a historically white figure. So imagine the outcry if um, a white actress played someone like Harriet Tubman. You know, it, it just would be immediately denounced as white face. And I, I'm well aware that Hollywood has had a history of that, or sorry, black facing. Um, but it now it just looks like, oh, well, we'll just kind of do this just because we can. Let's forget historical reality. And anyone who says anything different is a racist. So these directors and actors are kind of injecting their their notion of box ticking into the film industry is it just gets tiresome. There was um I'm trying to remember what the film was, but there was one uh woman director who said she would not dream of having a white only cast, regardless of historic context. I think it was a period production. Um Downton Abbey got away with it. So that's one of the exceptions. But, you know, it's almost like you just have to box tick. And I think that's ridiculous. I think casting should be on, you know, the best actors and actresses who are suitable for the role. But for historic films, there has to be realism. Otherwise, to me, it loses credibility. And it's preposterous to say that's some sort of bigotry. You know, I wouldn't expect to see, I think it would be ridiculous to have a load of white actors or Asian actors in, let's say, a film set in 1950s Detroit. This wouldn't be that believable. Um, so I, I really think when it comes to history, context does matter as much as possible. There could be some flexibility, but let's have realism as well. And the reason we're not having realism is because, you know, directors just want to be woke. That's the reality. And I know that's controversial, might provoke some people, but that's the reality. Anyway, I, I've went off a bit on a tangent here, but perhaps this does relate to this backlash against cinema, because I know of people, and granted they are more on the right and conservative, but they feel that they're tired of being lectured by Hollywood. That's what it feels like. It feels like every film needs to have some sort of feminist message or diversity message and that's fine that has a place but it's literally now getting into films that don't even have anything to do with that subject so it does start to get tiresome there are exceptions i mean we have to look at this across the whole spectrum take for example rush the formula one film now that was quite traditional in some ways you know you had an alpha male kind of being celebrated in that film so i guess it's not across the board, but I do think there are certain things that directors wouldn't get away with. I mean, if if a director approached a big Hollywood studio and said, I want to make a film uh, celebrating a British military victory in the 19th century, that would be thrown out because immediately it would be, oh, this is celebrating colonialism. 
even though it might simply be celebrating the bravery of the individual troops, such as what the Zulu films done. They weren't, you know, uh, denigrating the Zulus as warriors. Um, in fact, if anything, they were honouring the bravery of the Zulus. Um, yet a film like that could not be made today. It just couldn't, because there would have to be an angle. It would have to be depicting the wicked imperial British. It couldn't just be about the bravery of the men individually. Um, so I think that's sad that that has changed. Um, even, say, a biopic about David Livingston, even though you know, he was forcefully against slavery, just the fact that he was a prominent Victorian, um, you know, they'd have to just, oh, well, well, that's, he's a white male Victorian, we can't celebrate him. Just, it's, I definitely think that's now being injected into the film industry and it's just tiresome. So that might explain a bit of the backlash against cinema. What I would say is there's still a lot of good quality films out there, but definitely there is this kind of interjection that is very clearly going on and it does get a bit polarizing. So, you know, the industry needs to be aware of that. They're polarizing a large part of their base. It's like this new Bond film, um, you know, based on the trailer, uh, the, the actress who's playing the new agent, a black woman um, immediately people are thinking well what, what sort of role is she going to have uh, oh, I mean stay in your lane Bond so immediately people are thinking um, and this might be misplaced oh well she's going to be a strong independent woman who puts down the sexist Bond uh, yeah except Bond fans don't want to see that they want to see action they want to see a good storyline they want a good villain but they do not want to be lectured they don't want you know, this feminist lecture in a Bond film, it just, it's just polarising and it's misplaced and I don't think it's fitting to the genre. Um, anyway, I could talk about this all day, but I don't want to be accused of being obsessed. I just think that the industry needs to really be aware of feedback and I, I think sometimes it's a bit arrogant, it doesn't always listen to feedback. Um, what else? Yeah, I mean, it's when I look at the Empire Cinema website, all these big films, it's like release date October, release date September, we're now in February. So it's it's quite deflating, actually. It's quite, quite concerned about the future of it. So what I'm going to do, the second it reopens, I'm going to see almost any film just to kind of help do my little part to help keep the big screen afloat. I'm prepared to even watch a mediocre film just to because I miss it that much. Okay, I know this was a lot longer. I did digress a bit, so apologies for that, but I think it's all relevant. Let me know your thoughts.